The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the May webinar. For today's webinar, we have two speakers, and uh, our, our speakers are Dr. Andrew Druck and Dr. Lala Mulugata. Sorry about that. Um, Dr. Drock is an executive committee member of CPMS. He is currently a senior research fellow in the Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. He previously was the assistant director of the Center for Cardiovascular Simulation at the Institute. Dr. Drock's research focuses on computational material science and biomedical engineering. Uh, he examines the biomechanics of growth and remodeling of, bio, of biological tissues, multi-scale modeling of materials, and uh, chemomechanical behavioral materials. He is currently a co-chair of the BMES Special Interest Group on Medical Devices. Dr. Lala Mulagata is currently Chief Scientist and Executive Director of InSilico Labs, LLC. He is also Director of Medalist Fitness LLC and a co-founder of CPMS. His current business ventures are focused on translation of biomedical computational and engineering research to enable individualized healthcare and peak performance. Prior to his current venture with InSilico Labs and Medalist Fitness, Lalan worked at NASA as the project lead scientist of NASA's Digital Astronaut Program. The Digital Astronaut Program was dedicated to implementing well-validated computational models to help predict and assess spaceflight health and performance risks and to enhance the development of health risk countermeasures. During his tenure uh, with the Digital Astronaut Program at NASA, Lalan played a strong role in the development and implementation of standardized methods for verification validation and credibility assessment of NASA's biomedical computational models. Both Dr. Mulugata and Dr. Drock will be presenting today's webinar uh, and they will be handing off between the presentations so please be aware that, of that. Uh, and with that I would like to welcome our two speakers today and welcome Dr. Mulugata and Dr. Drock. Thank you uh, for the kind uh, introductions. Uh, my name is uh, Lalam Muligeta, and uh, just to clarify, I don't have a doctorate, so just Lalam, <laughs> not, not doctor. Um, I don't want to mislead anybody on that. Um, so and, 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 uh, I'm going to kick off the presentation uh, on the 10 simple rules of credible practice and modeling simulation and how they've been applied to uh, a bone remodeling model and as well as a heart valve uh, uh, modeling model. Uh, as part of the presentation, I'll start off with an introduction to the Committee on Credible Practice of Modeling and Simulation in Healthcare and uh, give you an overview of the current <coughs> draft of 10 simple rules of credible practice that we've established and we're uh, continuing to progress on. And uh, uh, we'll follow that up with actually uh, two real world examples of how those 10 simple rules can be applied to demonstrate credibility of uh, two different models. So uh, before the establishment of the committee, one of the challenges that we were encountering within the research community, particularly within the NIH and what's called the Interagency Modeling Analysis Group, where there was a lot of funding, uh, funded activity that was going on in development of biomedical models, was that um, a lot of the researchers were developing these models, but they, the models were not really seeing the light of day in terms of actually being applied for the clinical intentions that they had or even like the heavy research element to advance cl clinical uh, practice. And the, when we actually started asking the question of why that was, and what we found was that there wasn't common practice guidelines to actually uh, ensure that appropriate credible, credibility processes were followed in developing these models and, and uh, implementing them. So the end users like physicians and clinicians uh, didn't have any confidence in them and therefore they were not 
they were reluctant or not even willing to apply them. Um, so what we did was we uh, kind of uh, initiated the effort of establishing this committee under the Interagency Modeling Analysis Group and the Multi-Scale Mo uh, Modeling Consortium, which uh, uh, is listed down here, which is basically comprises of all these different agencies and also uh, a large number of researchers that are funded uh, as, as part of the Interagency Modeling Analysis Group funding activities. As you can see here, the, the committee is comprised of the executive members and the advisory council, where the executive members are in charge of executing uh, the charge of the committee. And the advisory council, is, they basically uh, review and advise of our overall progress. Basically, these are individuals who have you know, a great deal of experience in research, uh, academia, uh, industry, government, uh, and they basically, we have the benefit of, uh, of uh, basically uh, uh, getting their wisdom and adva advancing our initiative. And uh, Andrew, as you can see here, is the co-chair, the current co-chair, and Jerry Myers from NASA is uh, the other co-chair. Uh, Ahmed and I were the first uh, co-chairs when the committee first started. Now, as we, as we work to establish, to advance our efforts, we take a very multidisciplinary approach and we work across multiple organizations, like, like I said, government agencies, academic institutions, universities, uh, industry, uh, nonprofits, and so forth, to ensure that all the uh, stakeholders are represented and uh, the broad applications that are available across all those different entities and uh, disciplines are also represented and also the varying methodologies and procedures that each of those different fields use are also integrated so that we're, we do take a full account and to uh, the full scope of the field of research and uh, we don't try to reinvent the wheel either in the process. The committee really has five charges. Um, the first one is to um, establish guidelines and procedures for credible practice in computational medicine. And of course, making sure that we leverage readily available techniques so that we don't reinvent the wheel. Um, and uh, also the, defining novel uh, translational workflows where necessary. Uh, and of course, demonstrating all the different types of workflows, both that exist and the novel ones that, that are actually, uh, 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 that we end up uh, uh, creating, so to speak. And um, making sure that we also you know, conduct studies and dissem uh, disseminate the, the examples as we're doing here in, the, the, in this presentation or this, uh, this webinar. Um, in our work very early on, what we also discovered was that terminology was a big issue. So, for example, the term verification and validation, we were, we were finding that we're being interchange uh, used interchangeably amongst, the, say, a biologist versus a computational modeler. Uh, a model and simulation, that's another thing that was being, you know, also confused Sometimes even the term model, you know, some people may mean computational model, others may mean an animal model. So really tightening up the, the use of terminology so that everybody's communicating consistently, even if you don't use the word the same way, predefining it so that we, we, we understand each other is a very important element of ensuring credibility in how we uh, uh, use computational models to advance our uh, research initiatives. And of course, promoting good practice, because if you talk about, you know, establishing guidelines and workflows and whatever else, and all of these are good practices, but you never actually promote and demonstrate them then uh, through, you know, by outreach activities and so forth, like we're doing here in this webinar, then you're, it's really, you know, uh, a paper exercise, so to speak, rather than actually something meaningful. All of that combined is supposed to produce uh, targeted end products, namely, which is the main initiative that we're really focused on right now is uh, establishing guidelines for credible practice and modeling simulation in healthcare. Uh, and ultimately, at some point, we're, we're going to propose model certification process. And throughout both these uh, endeavors, we are, we're going to continue to identify new areas of research to advance both of them. And of course, we always welcome participation from the broader community in our initiative. This is not something that's the committee is for the community, so we always look for feedback and we have a very open platform on we do that using synthk.org. So in working towards our primary deliverable right now, the guideline for credible practice modeling simulation, we're actually 
basing that off of what we're calling the 10 simple rules of credible practice of modeling and simulation. And we take, we've taken a very goal-oriented activity on that where basically we have task teams within the committee that was responsible for identifying the essential elements of credible practice uh, and the full scope of how we, we uh, went about developing the 10 simple rules is uh, summarized in uh, this link here. And we'll make these uh, presentations uh, readily available on the uh, CPMS website as well. Um, so in addition to taking the uh, uh, action oriented within the committee, we really took a, a, a two main approaches to defining the 10 simple rules, and that's basically surveying the committee, which is basically when we had the uh, task teams identifying the key elements, and then we also recognize that, well, there's a, we're, tr we're trying to produce this for the broader community, so what does the broader community really have to say about what it takes to demonstrate credibility? So we surveyed the global community uh, where it really went, the survey went all around the world, and uh, we have synthesized all that data, and the raw data is available here as well. And both of these, uh, the committee's perspective and the, uh, the community's perspective are uh, going to be published independently, which are also going to translate to the uh, credible practice guidelines. Now, the outcome, the current draft of the 10 simple rules is as it looks here. Everything in the purple is the overlap that we found between the com what the community had to say and versus what the committee had to say. And all of this is basically things that we found kind of came to surface but weren't really overlapping between the two. Um, in any event, one thing we found consistently was that the first thing everybody seemed to kind of agree upon is that if you don't define the context of what you're developing the model for and the simulation for, uh, then you're kind of out to a bad start. So basically really articulating why you're doing what you're doing. Um, using appropriate data to uh, basically to use uh, traceable information to develop and operate and, uh, of uh, the model and simulation. Evaluate it within the context, so your verification, validation, uncertainty, quantification, all of that should be within the scope of where you intend to use the model. Uh, list the limitations explicitly. A lot of times as researchers, we can get very excited about our models and simulations and then the science that we're pursuing, and uh, we may become hesitant or to clearly say like you know where it's limited uh, and we tend to over promise but the reality is that it's important that we state very clearly what the model and simulation doesn't do as much as it, what it can do and what is intended to do uh, use version control so that there's always traceability time history traceability of the model uh, document it whether it's the code uh, the overall description of the model uh, uh, all that just doing as much documentation as possible so that if somebody was able to access your work, they'll be able to actually use it uh, and understand what you really did. Um, disseminate broadly. Now, in the most idealistic sense, that's giving everything you, you have to the broader community. That's not always possible and not everybody's inclined to do that. So at least providing in terms of like detailed publications and and, and uh, reports and really sharing as much as you can about the work that you've done so that you can continue, we can continue to advance the state of the art is really, really important. Uh, getting independent review, somebody that's nonpartisan, ideally, to basically check what you've done and uh, really that, uh, give you an honest feedback on uh, what you've done well and what you haven't done so well and what you can do to improve upon it. Because, you know, especially when we're talking about healthcare ensuring that we have the best information tools and tools to advance clinical practice and research is extremely important. Test computing implementations. Now, sometimes you can get too attached to our own methods, but the reality is that there are many different methods for given, any given research area that can be applied to answer questions and uh, you know, implement uh, therapeutics uh, more optimally, depending on what you're trying to uh, address. And, you know, so uh, very important to really compare and contrast uh, different ideas and implementing the best ones that are suitable for their question that you're trying to answer. And of course, conform to standards. Every field has, uh, you know, uh, research guidelines or standards, uh, you know, whether it's HIPAA or whatever it might be, making sure that, you know, you implement them so that you, you create rapport and confidence, especially with your end users, because if you have 
if you're working within a specific area of medicine, for example, and if you don't conform to the standards and guidelines that specific area of medicine has, you may not, you may lose credibility. They may not have confidence because, you know, their regulatory standards or whatever else uh, may be overlooked, so to speak. So with that all said, I'll kind of walk you through an example of how uh, the 10 simple rules were applied to a model of bone remodeling to demonstrate the credibility. So I, I do want to emphasize that the purpose of this presentation, of this example, is not uh, is, is to deliver uh, to, to demonstrate the deliberate process that we use, which is NASA standard 7009, to demonstrate the credibility of the model. Uh, the purpose of, uh, of this uh, uh, work is not to discuss uh, modeling techniques or science. Um, the, oh, I should have mentioned also the other thing is that even though we followed NASA standard 7009, which is a much more rigorous process than the 10 simple rules, um, a lot of the work that we did automatically mirrored over the 10 simple rules and, uh, and how the 10 simple rules can just as effectively communicate credibility of a model. If you want more details about the modeling techniques and the science aspect of this bone remodeling model, I would encourage you to uh, access this publication uh, and also the other uh, references that I'll have at the end of the presentation um, uh, so that you can get more insight in that area. So the problem that we were working to address is basically, as many people are aware, astronauts, when they're in space flight, they lose bone. Uh, and it's yeah, up to one to two percent a month uh, has been seen, and uh, a lot of the exercise protocols, even though they have improved over the years, have not been as effective to actually eliminate this this issue. And the areas that suffer the most are the, where all the weight bearing areas are, like the, the the proximal femur and the femoral neck region. And what this leads to basically is two major health risks to astronauts. Uh, first one is early onset of osteoporosis and uh, uh, eventually which may even lead to fracture later in their lives. So these are pretty important health risk areas that NASA wants to ensure that the astronauts don't, don't have to, uh, uh, they shouldn't have to face later on in their lives. So the objective was really what, what really causes bone demineralization and remodeling in spaceflight. And by using that information to uh, appropriately quantify the long-term health risks, both in terms of uh, osteoporosis or, uh, or fracture risk, and I'll also establish appropriate countermeasures or therapeutics, in other words, to mitigate these health risk issues. And there are a number of tools that NASA uses. One of the tools that was, has been proposed and has been used um, over the years is computational modeling and simulation. And NASA's Digital Astronaut Project was focused on applying computational methods to understand uh, the, the, uh, the physiologic effects spaceflight has uh, in, in many areas, and one of them being bone. So this was our workflow process on how we started to, you know, draft the idea of what the model is and then implement it. Now, um, what I wanted to draw your attention to is this uh, top part over here, where after we've received uh, the go-ahead from the administrative arm of NASA, so to speak, uh, what we did was we, we worked with researchers to articulate focused questions, research questions, and which then drives our modeling objectives and requirements, which actually speaks to the first rule of uh, the 10 simple rules, which is basically to define your context clearly. And the, the way we, uh, basically what we articulated in our objective of developing the, the bone remodeling model was first and foremost it's a research tool it's not a clinical tool and that's a very very important distinction to make uh, a lot of times it's very easy to over promise what a model does but the reality is that you have to be very clear if you're using it for research or clinical purposes because the, the level of rigor that you have to use to demonst demonstrate credibility in terms of like you know verification validation all uh, documentation they're vastly different animals. And with that in mind, the, the purpose of the model is to augment bone research and exercise countermeasure development by providing data that helps uh, researchers uh, to gain insight into the mechanisms of bone demineralization due to the exposure in microgravity. And also to gain insight on the volumetric changes 
uh, that take place at the various sites, <coughs> bone sites, in response to in-flight and post-flight exercise countermeasures. Um, and lastly, the data can also be useful for providing input into finite element methods that can help understand uh, changes in bone strength. <clears throat> now, it's also important to note that the model was not designed to predict bone fracture. And we found that it was very important to explicitly state this, just as much as it was important to explicitly state what it was intended for, because of uh, the two risks that we were trying to help inform osteoporosis and risk of fracture, some uh, were starting to kind of think that maybe this model also predicts fracture. That's not the case. Um, it, but it can provide data to models that can predict fracture. Um, so as part of our initial model development, which we called the beta model, uh, we started with the femoral neck region. And um, the reason why we picked the femoral neck uh, and a lot of times, actually, when you look at literature regarding bone remodeling and computational methods for that, they, they focus on a very generalized model that doesn't really talk about a specific bone site. And this is one of the things, one of the challenges that we had to face was predicting uh, changes for specific bone sites. So the site that we started off with was the femoral neck. And the reason was because that's a, a dynamically loaded, load-bearing uh, site. And it's highly susceptible to uh, uh, microgravity-induced uh, demineralization. And if fracture was to happen in that area, it can be quite debilitating. I think we're, uh, many of us are quite familiar with that. So it was set as a high priority. And once we would established uh, a good model that predicts uh, for that site, then we were going to build upon that as a backbone to uh, develop um, a, a, site-specific uh, models for the greater trochanter, lower lumbar, and other sites. In terms of its overarching implementation strategy, this is what it looked like, where it basically takes input from biomechanics models of exercise that we had, uh, or other uh, exercise uh, uh, simulators, uh, which provide input in terms of load stimulus at the given site, which then gives us output in terms of the time course change of the volumetric changes at that site. That data can be used for predicting bone strength change, uh, changes with uh, appropriate finite element models, which then provide insight into the efficacy of the exercise protocol to maintain bone health and then and therefore protect the long-term health risk of astronauts. So following that, what we had to do is uh, ensure that we were using appropriate data when we were developing the model, but the model, sorry. Um, when we initialized our parametric values, but we didn't have the luxury of conducting our own research. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of still ongoing work and, and, bone, and, and bone research where there's a lot of uncertainty. So at this point, the best that we could do was really go scour the literature and take the best data that we had available to us to initialize our parameters. And uh, uh, Dr. James Penline, who is the main developer of this model, um, he probably one of the smartest, if not the smartest person I've ever worked with, he had scoured the data and he found everything that, that could be imaginable. And so these are some of the examples of the initializations that we did to get the model basically uh, uh, initially started. Now, the model is designed to predict volumetric changes, which is very rare. A lot of times, computational models that look at bone mineral, uh, uh, bone changes, focus on just general density uh, uh, factors or aerial density. Um, tracking changes both in the trabecular and cortical region, there are very few models that actually do that. And, but that's partially because there's limited data in that respect as well. So when we were faced with the possibility of like, you know, validating the model, we had very limited uh, volumetric uh, QCT data, but we had a lot of DEXA data. Um, uh, so what we did was we developed a regression model that converts between QCT and, and aerial uh, BMD. And to ensure uh, that model was established uh, appropriately, we actually used flight data for, from 16 astronauts that had both QCT and DEXA, data, uh, DEXA scans done. Uh, and then we also validated that model using um, other QCT and, De uh, and DEXA data. Now, in terms of testing the 
the, the model itself um, and within the context, we focused on validation, uh, although there were other test uh, uh, evaluation that we did. Um, most of our efforts was spent on validation because that's what the uh, uh, customer or the client, the, the stakeholders were most interested in. And we clearly defined validation because there was always a, a misnomer that validation meant it's either right or wrong. That's the answer it gives you. Um, but the reality is that validation doesn't mean right if the model is right or wrong. It just means it tells you how close you are to predicting the real world system, right? So it's the degree to which you, the model is able to reproduce the observed behavior that you're interested in. So in our case, which is changes in bone, bone mineral density and bone volume fraction changes. So once we clearly define what that means and that, you know, we had our stakeholders uh, understand that, we, we defined our three criteria for uh, validating our model. The first and foremost one is the bone volume fraction, because if you actually read the paper, you'll find that the base equation is the, as, a, as a bone volume fraction equation, which is basically when we initialize the model using bone mineral density, that density value is converted to bone volume fraction, and then the, the cellular dynamics and everything else takes over. So if you don't get this base equation right, or you know, moving in the direction that you need to uh, move, the whole thing is basically you're wasting your time. So we had to make sure that this was right first and foremost, or rather, it, at least it it, uh, uh, it got us in an area that we knew we were in the ballpark. Um, and then following that, we would look, uh, we, we validated for volumetric changes, both trabecular cortical bone at that uh, specific site, and then uh, aerial bone mineral density as well, so that we had validation for both types of densities so that we can uh, run simulations for any kind of data that may be readily available to us. These are the results that we found when we actually ran it for bone volume fraction. Um, as you can see here, this was literature data for the proximal femur, and we weren't able to find any uh, femoral neck data, but the proximal femur was as close as we can get, and when we ran our simulations from the various data sets that we had, uh, the predictions were in the ballpark, or at least it gave us some degree of confidence that we were headed in the right direction. When we looked at bone volume fraction, that's for, sorry, uh, bone mineral density, volumetric bone mineral density for trabecular cort cortical bone, uh, these are the results where we had four bed rest subjects, not space flight, this was all bed rest data. Um, we found that three of the four subjects, um, their, their data seemed to match reasonably well. Uh, but one of them was way off, and when we actually looked at that data very closely, what we found is that the subject actually had uh, bone density that was similar to uh, an elderly person with age-related bone loss. Uh, now, the question is, is this representative of the astronaut population? And this is a question that we kind of struggled with for some time, and uh, it's still a question that's up in the air. Um, so that's an ongoing issue that that has to be dealt with. When we actually looked at time course changes of bone density using aerial density, we found that the model actually tracks quite well with the data set that we had as well. So overall, what we found is that the model was most reliable for making predictions for bed rest conditions, which is a space flight analog. Uh, and it has, and it's most reliable for predicting mean values rather than subject specific. It has some limited subject specific prediction capability, but not a whole lot. There was a lot, there's still a lot of work that we need to do in that area. But if we did establish a good foundation for basically creating a physiologically meaningful bone remodeling model that can someday simulate space flight, uh, the effect of space flight on uh, bone changes. Uh, but we still have to do a lot more verification, sensitivity, and uh, analysis and so forth to really develop a robust confidence in the, in the model, or the uh, robust credibility of the model. There were many limitations, um, and a lot of people get scared <laughs> when they see this many limitations listed, but it's important to know where you're, where, where you're, what you're missing so that you can actually address it appropriately so that they can be full confidence along the way. Um, it's just as important to know what you're missing as it is what, what you're doing well at. Uh, I won't go all of them in detail, but some of the examples are basically, you know, it only, uh, the model doesn't cover uh, the 
peri periosteal opposition and endocortical changes. Um, can't, can't do subject specific uh, simulations based on age and gender differences. Um, and the population range that it's applicable for is between ages 25 and 55, which is good for us because that's where the astronaut population is. But it's also, it gives you a rough estimate, not a subject specific. Now, anybody that is interested in running simulations for younger population or older population, they probably should not be using this model because that's all the data that we have to initialize the parameters are within this scope. So just to give you an idea of the kind of limitations that we explicitly stated, um, even the duration to which the model has been validated is up to four months. Um, uh, so we need to uh, explicitly, so if somebody was trying to make a prediction, let's say 10 years out, probably wouldn't work as well. So that these limitations were due to our modeling approach and there are limitations that are just inherent to bone science. There's just so many unknowns. So we listed those explicitly as well, because at some point we, when we were discussing with different subject matter experts, um, some of them started to think that we were saying that our model solves all the problems. Uh, meanwhile, you know, they're like, well, I've been doing this for a long time and you you can't tell me this thing solves everything, but that's not what we were saying. So we started listing uh, these limitations explicitly so that we tell them that we acknowledge there are a lot of unknowns about the, the discipline, and this model is only intended to provide you partial data that can get you further along in solving this uh, grander problem. So using version control, as you can see, this is our workflow on how we actually implemented computational models as part of the spaceflight physio uh, physio physiology research. Um, so version control is a very important aspect of it. So we did, made regular commits and we, made, we uh, released stable versions with appropriate documentation, which is the sixth rule of the 10 simple rules, where basically the documentation included appropriate doc uh, documentation of the code for modelers and scientists. So the, the end user who knows nothing about uh, uh, the science or the or modeling in general may not uh, understand it. But we did have graphic, uh, basic graphical inter interface, uh, user interface that the, a lay user would be able to uh, implement quite readily. Um, and every model delivery that we made was accompanied with a report. Um, we also made uh, regular presentations, briefings to our stakeholders at quarterly meetings, annual agency reports, and annual investigators workshops, which is basically where all the researchers get together and talk about the state of the art. And we also uh, published peer-reviewed articles, conference presentations, technical memorandums, and so forth, which you can all find if you go on the NASA technical report server and search Penline Mulugeta, you'll find um, uh, a, a number of them, which uh, you can gain insight to how much we actually uh, discussed, uh, regard, uh, uh, documented regarding the, the model. Uh, in terms of disseminating uh, broadly, um, this model was intended for internal use, so it wasn't really disseminated to the public. But in terms of the technical elements of it, we published in peer-reviewed articles, technical memos, and so forth. Once again, you can look all, all that up on the NASA Technical Report Server by searching Penline and Mulugeta, or uh, NASA Digital Astronaut Project uh, uh, Bone Remodeling Model. So in terms of getting independent reviews, NASA Standard 7009 automatically required uh, technical review, um, uh, especially for the type of work that we were doing, where typically we had our stakeholders do what was called a level two review, where basically they uh, sat down with us, we presented to them what, what we our findings were, what the capabilities were, they would give us feedback, and that would lead us towards what our next iteration would be. But we've also had to provide reports to subject matter experts that were external to NASA, which then reviewed the content of that report provided feedback to the uh, NASA bone discipline lead to, to let that person know what the model is, uh, if, the, if and how the model can be used for NASA's purposes and what needs to be augmented to make it more useful. Uh, test competing implementations. Now, the, the whole foundation of how this model was developed was exactly that. We did a lot of comparing, contrasting, combining, and modifying a previously developed sets of biochemical cellular dynamics and biochemical, bio, uh, uh, mechanical stimulus 
equations to actually derive this this uh, very sophisticated model. And this has been an ongoing process. And if you actually go on the National Technical Survey, you'll find that there are a lot of different compare and contrast uh, documents that we've developed uh, along the way. And then lastly, conforming standards. You know, since we were following NASA standard 7009, according to NASA's interests, we were need, we were conforming to that standard. And of course, because we handle a lot of human subject data, we conformed with HIPAA quite rigorously. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Andrew. Hey, uh, thanks, Lalam, and thanks everybody for attending. And uh, thank you, organizers, for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to take on from here and move slightly in different direction uh, in the sense that we're still talking about 10 simple rules and we're talking about how they apply for research. But in my case, uh, because it was academic research at UT Austin, it wasn't as comprehensively covered in terms of following all the rules. But we try to follow as many as we can within the context of doing um, NIH funded research. So this work is uh, uh, research by uh, Michael Sachs group and the Gorman group at uh, University of Texas and the University of Pennsylvania. And the, the main thrust of the work was on developing image-based models of mitral valve. Um, for those of you who are not in cardiovascular, so mitral valve is a bicuspid valve um, in, the, in one of the four chambers. Um, and um, its main components are annulus, leaflets, and papillary muscles. And then papillary muscles and the leaflets are connected through uh, more or less tendons, uh, or what they're properly called, chordae tendinae. And um, what I'm going to go through is I'm going to throw, go through sort of story of how we modeled it. But I'm going to highlight in the title which rule it actually addresses. So we're going to start off with the context. And as Lalam said, that's, that's a really important piece of it is why are we doing this? What do we expect from it? And do we really understand the limitations or ramifications of using the model and make an inference from it? So in this case, the long-term objective is to get the model into the clinical setting where we can do non-invasive uh, uh, evaluation of the patient condition and uh, we can predict sort of what's going on with the valve and possibly eventually understand which direction to go in terms of treatment. But that's a very long-term objective. Realistically, what we're trying to achieve and what we achieved as a proof of concept is getting local strain information and estimates on the valve sort of distribution of the stresses and strains in the leaflets. And um, then we validated that using both in vitro and um, partially in vivo models. And this is not a diagnostic tool, and this is a far from being able to be used in um, clinical setting, but we do explicitly show that this is a good first step of using model to be uh, useful supplementary information in the clinical setting. Okay, so talking over property data, so extracting data from human patients um, or getting clinical data is very difficult, both because of the imaging difficulties and uh, the associated expenses and capital costs. What we did while developing the model, before we jumped into in vivo model, we developed an in vitro model using uh, ovine, so animal model, and that was done in collaboration with Georgia Tech. And uh, that model was comprehensively instrumented, uh, imaged in nine states, and it was done on several different specimens. So overall, we, come, we generated a data set of something like 100 gigabytes of imaging data that was then converted into the models and ran through the whole pipeline. And um, talking of the pipeline and what it takes to actually generate an image-based model, this is just a short overview of more or less more than two years of work that went into it. Um, and it has two segments to it. One segment is extracting leaflets. So generating high fidelity model of the leaflets of the valve. And on the right model for, or a pipeline for generating high fidelity geometric model, um, which eventually becomes a proper computational biomechanical model for Cordae. And at the very bottom, I list out um, software packages that we use in Greenbox, open source, in Redbox, uh, commercial packages. And the goal here was to make the model as traceable as um, user-friendly as possible, so we shifted a lot of work from commercial codes to open source code where we could. Of course, not everything can be achieved through open source, so we ended up still using 
uh, two packages that were necessary to complete the pipeline. When you have so many packages and you have so many steps, um, what really becomes important, as, as already mentioned, is version control. So in this case, the whole pipeline was instrumented and documented using Jupyter and uh, versions on uh, uh, Git, and Bitbucket is just one of the cloud providers of a Git system. Um, so as you can see here, we have commits, we have versioning, we have dates, and we have the author uh, who pushed the commits into the master branch. And um, what was also interesting is that we chose Jupyter, and if you've never used it, it's, um, it's an environment for working with the Python scripts, which is a hybrid environment for both coding and documenting. Um, and because it's um, Python files, they, of course, can be versioned. So in a sense, we did document everything, um, but um, not, not as to the level that we can say that it's publicly usable information. So here's an example of one of the scripts in the uh, repository. On the left, you see the actual code. On the right, you see a second view of this, and Jupyter allows you to do it. It allows you to show the code and the markup or the comments. So you can see on the left, the actual code, on the right, the execution, and you can also have a third view where everything is in parallel. So you can see that the code is immediately documented and has intera not interactive, but visual pieces where it immediately reports back what it's running, what it's generating, and has a login system, which also provides uh, log entries on when the code was run with which parameters. So you can actually go through journal of events and how people use the model and what they got to achieve the results that they wanted. So we have full traceability and full debugging of the whole system. What's missing in this case is if we look at the repository, we have version documentation, we have version comments, we have logs of execution, but we don't have documentation in the sense of tutorials and user guides, which would be helpful for onboarding new users for the system. Okay, so then moving on, um, let's talk about the actual simulation plan and what we did with the model. And that, that binds back to context. So when we collected the data, we collected data for every specimen in nine different states. And uh, we had to make a decision what we're gonna use for calibration, what we're gonna use for validation, and what's actually gonna be predictive part. So for that, we separated the data into calibration data set, validation data set. And then what we called prediction was both predicting the states that we not, did not image and predicting states for in vivo models or in vivo data sets, whereas we only collect data for in vitro. So that's sort of very clear definition of what we can do and what the boundaries are of what we validated and calibrated. So we know that if we go off those boundaries, we don't have much confidence of what's going outside of that box. And now just an example. So when we collect all the data, uh, this is just a rough example of what we generate from finite element model. So in this case, we generated valve closure or what it's called captation in normal state, dilated or infarcted state and post repair state where we take infarcted geometry and use flat ring repair. And in this case, we show three different rows, one for strains, another one for stresses, and the third one for uh, fiber re realignment or fiber engagement in the tissue. Okay, now let's talk about principles nine and 10, competing implementation and conform to standards. I immediately can say that 10 was not followed much. I mean, we did follow standards for annual trials and for uh, patient information confidentiality, but there's not much out there that can be used for guiding uh, development of model of mitral valve or sort of taking it through the basis. Um, or in this case, also there are not many competing implementations by other research groups, sorry, uh, by other research groups in uh, having mitral valve models that were validated and rigorously tested in different settings. So what we're left with is, if we don't have much to compare with, you, what you can still do is you can evaluate your own competing implementations. So in this case, what we did is we know that we have a complex pipeline and we know we'll have a lot of moving pieces. We wanted to evaluate the sensitivity to different parameters. So in this case, we ran sensitivity study for the level of resolution. So we developed a model that allows us to generate um, different level of detail for the geometry. So on the very left, you see very smooth, what we call very low, low resolution model to the very right, to the upright, where we have the highest resolution, high fidelity model that reproduces every wrinkle in the image that we captured. And we can gradually transition between them and see what's the effect of level of resolution. 
Uh, separately, we did a standard test for any finite element model, which is the level of fixturization, and are we in the converged zone for the mesh? It's more of a sanity check, but it's also necessary to show that the model is robust and behaves as expected. Another important point is um, there is uh, literally dozens and dozens of models of the behavior of t bio tissues. In this case, for mitral alpha leaflet tissue, we evaluated several models and several different uh, parameters of two of those models to see what kind of effect they had on the captured behavior. And then we compared it to the um, sort of gold standard, which in our case is fully instrumented in vitro data sets. Um, so we could out evaluate how much change of material model had an effect on the predicted stresses and strains in the simulation. Uh, next, we also had a difficult um, issue with uh, calibrating cordi state. And if you've ever done any organ level simulations, you'll know that it's very difficult to take reference data from the lab and generate accurate predictions without, um, without um, accounting for natural pre-strain or pre-stress in the, in the organs or in the human body. Um, so in this case, we played with different uh, strategies and different methods for generating pre-strain for the cordae. And we evaluated that effect and found how that affects the fidelity of the simulation results. So then in the end, when we took all of it together, um, we had literally like hundreds of simulations of different combinations, but what makes it easy to compare is when we take and divide it into what process engineers do into high, low, and medium settings. So then we took normal state, disease state, and repaired states, and we, um, compared model results from low fidelity model with low level resolution and primitive material model versus the highest fidelity possible, the most complicated model that we could combine to see what the differences are and evaluate it does it really require such a level of detail and complexity. And we found actually that there is a happy middle ground where your level of detail and level of calibration is not as intense as it is for high fidelity model, but you get relatively good data for all all for all three states. So normal uh, diseased and repaired. And then, of course, we compared everything back to the imaging data directly, not even process data, just raw micro CT image data, just to see, uh, essentially, just to limit any effect of data processing. Okay, so now talking of evaluation, um, there was an interesting question that we had is when we try to evaluate how good the model is, first of all, it has to be in a specific context. So in this case, let's talk about evaluating in vitro data we collected. And we have many options. We can compare the strains. We can compare the stresses. We can compare the fiber alignment. We can compare just pure geometry or curvature uh, in the system. So what we came up with is sort of a multi-objective, simplistic, it's very simplistic algebraic metric where we take an average of the deviations between the gold standard and the simplified models. And here you can see the effect of going from the highest fidelity model uh, down to the simpler and simpler models together with actually computational time required on the same system or for a single CPU system. So how much time it takes to, to run the model. And for example, you can see here a good example where at lower level of detail and a much sort of simple, much simpler calibration procedure, you more or less cut down computational time by a factor of three and yet you don't lose confidence in your results or predictive power of your results. Um, so things like that are really important to understand what's the utility or what's the actual real world use for the model. And then moving from in vitro, our, our final goal was actually to understand the, the accuracy of the model for in vivo. So we did have access to some limited uh, validation data using sonic crystal measurements from uh, live animals. And we compared our final element model that was developed based on the in vitro and adapted to in vivo state and compared how that predicts the strains in the belly region of the anterior leaflet. And in this case, you can see that for both radial and circumferential leaflets, we actually are quite close to the measured data. So we did actually evaluate in the proper context, not only in lab setting, but also in the clinical setting. Again, it's not human data that would be, actually, I don't even know at this point, how would we do that? But for as close as possible animal live data, we could compare it and uh, show that within that context, it still works as expected. Okay, and then let's talk about limitations, because I mean, all of it is fun and it's wonderful and it's 
beautiful pictures, but we have to understand that this model has its own context. And as I said, it has its own box of region of like where you can implement, where you can test it, what you can expect from it. And on top of it, it has a specific set of assumptions. So in every publication that we put out on this, we usually set specifically set limit set limitation of the system and simplifications that were necessary to get to the point where we are. And when you combine that information together with information of where it's applicable to use the model, you can say that you know pretty damn well what, what's possible and what you can rely on without going marching in a dangerous territory where the simplifications might actually cause deviation from the ground truth. Okay, and then point seven and eight, dissemination and independent reviews. So because it was academic work funded by NIH, we actually did generate a lot of peer-reviewed publications. So this was resulting in nine publications and roughly 40 presentations at international conferences. But unfortunately, we did not, due to some limitations um, on dissemination in, in the lab policies, we could not ask external users or independent users to take on the model and play with it and tell us what they think. That might happen in the future, but as of today, the model has only been used by um, sort of lab members or internally by people who developed it. Um, and then when we talk about independent reviews, it's a similar story. We did get peer review of publications, but not peer review of actual modeling process and sort of uh, comprehensiveness of the model formulation or model documentation. Um, I wanna thank our collaborators um, on the project. It's Georgia Tech uh, researchers, and of course the funding source, it was funded by NIH and HLBI grants. And I want to provide a short summary of 10 simple rules and how they were actually implemented in this project. So rules one, two, and three were, I would say, well implemented. So the level would be really good as, as much as we explained in the guidance for the 10 simple rules. Number four, um, it's so-so or average because we did not have comprehensive evaluation of how it can be immediately used to comprehend in clinical application and what are the ramifications of trying to rely on it for actual real world decisions. But we did get to the proof concept and sort of a good instrumented or documented model in the proof concept stage. We did get good use of your version control and uh, we try to disseminate as broadly as we can. In terms of documentation, we do lack tutorials and user guide for this model. So that requires more work to get to the good level. And uh, in terms of reviews, again, we don't have any reviews by independent users or evaluators. So that will be necessary to get broader acceptance and sort of build public confidence in the model. Um, the same goes for competing implementations. We did not have much luck or much um, information on how to compare it against existing models approaches because that's relatively new area uh, where there's not that many image-based or non-simplified models for mitral valve. And then conforming to standards, uh, I'd say we did a bad job. We did not do much research on, on what standards, besides the actual practices for experiments and running clinical, not clinical, but animal studies, we did not do much to see if there is any ISO or NASA or ASME standards that are applicable for this case. Um, that wraps up the presentation. And I wanna thank you, thank you everybody. And I'm gonna hand it back to Walam. Thank you uh, to our speakers and for our audience, uh, if you have any questions, you can enter them into the uh, questions pane on your GoToWebinar side panel. Uh, we do have one initial question, which is for existing models or previously published models, how realistic is it to go back and update the documentation to try and meet these 10 uh, rules of practice? And this was this was put for either of our speakers, or both, actually. Okay, I'll take a stab at that. So, and it's quite doable. Um, so, as part of uh, my when I was the uh, project scientist uh, at NASA, one of the things that I was responsible for, and even when I was the uh, like a project engineer, we reviewed a number of models which may not have gone through a similar process as 7009 or 10 simple rules. And we did evaluate their level of credibility for uh, what we 
uh, our context of use. And based off of that, we've done basically uh, inclusion or exclusion of different modeling schemes uh, for our needs. So it's, it's always it's, it's quite possible, especially if you have a strong interest in having uh, other user parties have confidence in what you're what you've done. I would say going through the process of doing it is uh, useful and it's it's very doable. And if you need help or guidance to do that, uh, the committee is that's part of our charge. So you can always reach out to us. Okay. And what about models that are currently that currently exist on databases like biomodels.net? How do how are are those going to be moved to this credible practice or um, anything like them being handled? So um, I'm so, gonna jump in here as well. Um, that's that's a very good point, and um, that sort of goes hand in hand with um, um, efforts to develop model description languages because we do need to have. Um, sort of an agreed upon set of rules for not only describing the models or documenting the models, but also putting them through all the paces of something, something like tensible rules where you can say that, okay, we looked at it comprehensively, not from just the perspective of can I run it, but also for what I can expect it and what phenomena or what questions this model can answer. And this is just a guideline how to do it. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the final sort of um, set of rules that everybody has to follow, but it provides a good template of how to structure things. And it really depends on um, how much of a journaling was done while the model was being developed, because sometimes when this model is already there and they only had sort of help file or readme.md with a set of parameters to use, but not any use cases or context, it might be difficult to revive that information and collect it to sort of complete the model description. Okay, so uh, in order, I, I'm gonna paraphrase on this one, in order for a model to uh, be brought to, to code, so to speak, you're probably going to need the original modelers who worked on it. And, and unless documentation is quite good. Is that? Uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty much what I had in my experiences. Um, usually you have to chase back the person who actually did most of the work on it and knows most about the model and then try to put it all in writing in, in sort of structured form. Okay. And we have just enough time for about one more question. And uh, this one came through its... Um, uh, actually, we have two questions uh, that I'd like to ask. Um, one is uh, for uh, our first speaker, do you have age and sex match controls for your model? Um, so if I heard that correctly, it's age and sex match controls? Yes. Yeah, so no. And that was uh, one of the limitations is that uh, controlling for age and sex is um, basically we just we uh, initialize the parameters based off of all the literature data that was available that spanned uh, age ranges between 25 and 55, and both for male and female. So it kind of lumps everybody together. And uh, the last question uh, is: Could you show again the uh, con the links? for where we could get more information about the rules. So the, sure. the questioner would like to uh, get a bit more information sure. and didn't write the link down. So, um, and I will mention that the slides mm -hmm. and uh, recording of the webinar will be posted for our audience uh, on the website. So uh, this will be available uh, very shortly uh, for anybody who wants to go back and look at the slides again or look at listen to the recording and uh, follow through the links. Yes, and, and what, uh, what, 
once you actually go to the CPMS website, the, this uh, pre our presentations will be uh, available. Uh, and generally, we keep them in the publication section, or you can reach out to us using our contact information uh, on online, and then uh, we can give you whatever you need. Thank you, and thank you to our two speakers, Dr. Drock and uh, Mulugara, and uh, thank you to our audience, uh, and we are out of time. So have a great day, everybody, and I hope to see you at a future webinar. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>